um, because uh, <laughs> um, it's been an extraordinary honor to uh, to serve you in the Missouri Senate, and uh, it's been great to be part of, have been part of this. This was my favorite job in politics. I've done other things in politics, but I can tell you I had no idea when I went down there how the state affects so much, and you don't really realize or comprehend the size and scope of the state of how it touches everything. And one subject I'll get to before I talk about a couple of other things is, you know, I think about, you know, everybody saying that I was crazy and other people were crazy uh, in the boundary change with the Kansas City School District. And, you know, when you go to Van Horn and uh, last May, as I did, and saw the graduation rate go to, go, go up to 86%. Um, and you see the faces of those families. And I know we, um, I have a lot of disingenuous pieces of wood and glass and metal in my office from, from groups who give me an award because I'm a state senator. And, you know, there's one award I really prize, which was, it's a very simple thing. It's in glass and it's from the student council of uh, Van Horn. And uh, they gave me a, an award uh, last year and uh, uh, I know they came down and they were in the Senate chamber and I introduced them on the Senate floor. And uh, after it was over, a good friend of mine, a Republican, Charlie Shields, who had actually gone to Van Horn, um, this was a couple years ago, I'm sorry, let me correct myself. Um, he, I, I knew he went to Van Horn and so I had him come over and say, hey, this is the Van Horn um, Student Council and uh, a girl, came up to us and hugged us and started crying and said, uh, you know, I want to thank you guys. And because I introduced Charlie Shields and said, you know, he, he'd been very helpful and this was a bipartisan effort. And uh, she was crying and she said, you know, that it, everything's so great now and it just changed my sister and I's lives. And I kind of turned to Charlie Shields and I said, you know, we normally don't get that reaction when we pass the insurance industry bill. You know, so it's it's a great opportunity the law affords you the ability to be part of something so much bigger than oneself. And that's kind of what you see at the state. And I have a, a privilege, uh, I see Paula Vogt in the back, and I've had the privilege of serving with Paul when he was before he was term limited. And I, uh, my roommate's here, Tom McDonald, um, and Tom does a tremendous job. And, uh, uh, you know, we should support people who, who are genuine and sincere, and, and both those gentlemen are. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to, and I know uh, Jerry, when he called me, and I know Jerry and Judy for the last 20 years, uh, uh, as I like to say, you know, I've known them for 20 years, we've been friends for almost nine of those, but anyway, uh, no, uh, <laughs> no, no, we've been very good friends, and they've been very uh, kind to always invite me and give an opportunity to speak with you. Um, you know, we tend to hear about whatever happens in Washington and whatever, I think in Jackson County, we can be proud of the fact that, that uh, through a lot of hard work of a lot of people in this room, um, you know, you hear good news about it's great in this country to start making things again, isn't it? And, you know, people don't really realize how important that Ford bill was. But that with, you know, doing handling their taxes differently, I mean, it wasn't a bailout. They're making a $1.3 billion investment in this community. They're adding 1,800 jobs and retaining 3,700 others. And you, you just do the basic math, and for $100 million, which sounds like a big amount of money, over 10 years from the state, just do the math on that 1,700 jobs. The average wage is forty-five dollars to $50,000. Those are jobs that have a, they're quality jobs. They mean that that worker, man or woman, joins the middle class and is able to afford a home on a salary like that, send their kids to college. And you do the math on that and you think, you know, that's that's six, seven hundred million dollars in salaries, you know, just with the new jobs. Then you consider the plan itself. It's going to be 1.3 million man hours of construction. So, you know, just the assembly line is 1,700 jobs that will change somebody's life and, and, and start building things in this country. And, you know, I, I've i certainly had my share of criticism of the U.S. auto industry, but it's just great that General Motors announced today is the biggest car manufacturer in the world again. 
And, you know, we, we make those investments as a country and we make those investments as a people. And it's, it's great to, to see that. And that four bill changed lives in Wentzville over on the eastern side of the state. GM announced the $350 million. So it's great in our state to start building things again and, 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 ha and having people hired again. So there's enough bad news and we can argue and debate about that. But it's good to, to have been kind of part of things like that. Um, Jerry, when he invited me, wanted me to talk about the school situation, which I have some experience in. Um, the loss of accreditation by the Kansas City School District creates extraordinary challenges uh, for all the surrounding districts. Now, I will tell you, this being my last year, quite frankly, I thought I was done with all this. <laughs> but... Um, the loss of accreditation, and I think everybody has to realize, you probably will read in the media something called the Turner decision, and essentially what it means is, in Missouri state law, if a district becomes unaccredited, the law trying to give that person rights says, look, you have a right for your child to get a good education. And so the problem with that is there's several problems in the challenges facing this whole situation. The first challenge is, okay, you're the Raytown School District. You're the independent school district. You're North Kansas City. You're Hickman Mills. You're Center School District. You're right next to the Kansas City School District. If we do nothing, and everybody just goes, well, you know, Kansas City can get try to get their accreditation back and da-da-da-da-da. <coughs> if we do nothing, your superintendents and your school boards and you as taxpayers are faced because of that Turner situation to literally have the Raytown School District this August if the court made a decision one way and we didn't do anything. They could have the prospect of having 400, 400 kids show up in August and say, hey, the statute book says we have a right to an accredited unit and here we are. We're here in Raytown. We're here in Independence. We're here in North Kansas City. We're here in Center. So we have to do something. I don't I would rather not have this problem, but we have to do something. And part of the thing is we have to define to make it fair and balanced for you as taxpayers, not just for the people in the Kansas City School District, but also for you as Raytown School District taxpayers. Because imagine the burden it places if you don't have any control. How is that child paid for? Um, it, you know, we, we're talking about tuition and how they would work a, a, something out with the Raytown School District where the Raytown School District would say, well, you know, it costs us $9,876 to educate a child, but does that cover all the costs? Is that fair? So there's problems like that. Um, back in June, before Kansas City lost their accreditation, I started working on a boundary change bill. Now, you'll read in the uh, often completely wrong Kansas City Star uh, <laughs> that this is my plan to dismantle the Kansas City School District. <clears throat> Um, even though I've been interviewed by three different reporters um, from the Kansas City Star, and they've been 20 or 30 minute interviews, and I read my comment and it's one sentence, I have not been allowed to give you the explanation that I've given all of them because they haven't bothered to print it, which is the following. Boundary change, the, bound, the school boundary change, which we utilized in 2007 in Independence, involving Western Independence Sugar, is current law. So keep in mind, tomorrow morning in theory, Somebody from the Kansas City School District, neighbors in the Kansas City School District would say, we're tired of this. Let's go talk to an adjoining district. And then let's say some citizens and taxpayers in the Raytown School District said, yeah, let's take this section of the district and let's have that. And so they both circulate petitions and they have an election. That's current law. The problem is I've been through one of those. And I foresaw a need that sensing that there was going to be problems with the Kansas City School District, that taxpayers, the problem with what we did in 2007 is independent school district took a tremendous risk because the way the law is now, you don't know as taxpayers in the Kansas City School District or in the, in the independent school district, for example, in that case, what it was going to cost, who was going to handle what. Some of you probably remember even post-election, we had to go to court to get the buildings even after the election was over. And so 
What my bill on the boundary change attempts to do is to say, look, let's add a process up front if and only if a boundary change is sought, that the taxpayers in both districts know how much it's going to cost, when it's going to happen, when they start school, this August or next year, and tries to add some transparency and accountability to that process up front so you know whether it's the most important thing of all, and this is often kind of misstated, its main advantage is also its disadvantage. It doesn't force any taxpayers to do anything. There may not be another boundary change in the Kansas City School District. But regardless of that, I can see that there might be well-meaning taxpayers in Kansas City who, faced with the frustration of what's going on, try to pursue one. And I don't want them to go through the same uncertainty and doubt and lack of knowledge and lack of information that we faced. So I'm not recommending a boundary change. I'm just merely saying we better improve it before I leave the building just in case somebody does one. And maybe somebody pursues one that isn't a good idea. So as you read about this situation, I'm not recommending it. I think, quite frankly, over time, that it might make sense somewhere. Is it a total solution to the Kansas City School District? Absolutely not. Um, in December, uh, with the boundary change, uh, Senator Curls, Kiki Curls, who was here last month, and several state reps, um, and most of the school superintendents met at the Raytown School District. And um, the suburban superintendents were very concerned about the Turner decision for the reasons I stated that there's uncertainty uh, they don't know. They want some surety to the process because they have to educate your kids and your grandkids, and they have to report to the <coughs> school board. Um, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty with this whole situation. And in an effort to reach that certainty, um, they talked about a potential of contracting part of the Kansas City School District that might adjoin their districts. Now, some people have decried this, but keep in mind, I think we're very fortunate in this metro area that we have superintendents who want to protect you as taxpayers, who want to get as much answered in a controlled way. Because the potential of the status quo is there will be a lot of uncertainty, and that circumstance of having 500 kids show up unexpectedly in August could well happen. And so we've got that as, as, as a mechanism. And overall in the Kansas City School District, I look at it like I want to arm and empower taxpayers to have tools in a toolbox. And if it makes sense, use it. If it doesn't, and I don't think there's one tool that fixes all the problems. But here's my point. If you consider the Kansas City School District, and I know this from my own experience, in four decades, the only question the, the taxpayers and voters of the Kansas City School District have been asked is who's on their school board in four decades, except once in 2007, when they overwhelmingly, both districts, allowed 35,000 people from Western Independence and Sugar Creek to leave. And that was approved by both districts. What that teaches me is I don't want, with all due respect, a judge, the state commissioner of education, or a mayor to make those decisions. I want to put in law the ability for taxpayers and, and voters to make those decisions. And that, in my view, has been one of the fundamental problems of that district. Taxpayers are disenfranchised, aren't asked questions, and we've had that for four decades. So, um, again, I appreciate you um, inviting me tonight. Uh, I hope that clarifies everything. And since there's no questions, I'll leave. No. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, there are questions. Yeah. Uh, how do you want to leave? Uh, so how do you, you know, we, we just get uh, bits and pieces of different plans. Right. So I don't know the details of uh, Sly's uh, plan. Right. But, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I felt like when I saw him on TV the other day talking to Haynes that he was actually putting his political capital up to try to do something with the district. I thought that was pretty bold. 
And so, uh, what what in his plan? I mean, I don't know what his plan is. The problem that have you looked at it? <coughs> yeah, uh, and, and yeah, and I've met with, with them. Or I've yeah, met, okay. I've met with Sly James, and because uh, I thought, hey, if he's willing to do that, I'm willing to let you. <laughs> well, um, the problem is you won't have the power to do that, and that's one of the deficiencies of his plan. No set of voters or taxpayers to convey that authority, uh, except after he's run it for three years and he runs for re-election. Mayor of Kansas City exists within a charter, within the charter of the city of Kansas City. The charter is like the Constitution. It's approved by the way you, ch you change a charter is going to your voters. Okay, it's like the Constitution of the city. You don't have a strong mayor form of government. That's a decision by the voters of Kansas City they made years ago. He's one of 13 council members who is involved in hiring a city manager to run the city. He has duties and responsibilities as mayor. Um, I think with all due respect, I have no doubt of his passion, concern. I think he can be extraordinarily helpful in this process, but I'm not sure when you're running a city or in his capacity that you should hand the keys over <laughs> to, uh, to a $262 million district, uh, district for him to run. Um, and well, it did sound like to me it was just going to be him. He was going to make sure that people were who could. De deferred by who? Oh, yeah. Picked how? <coughs> who makes that decision? Yeah. Who makes like the him. decision? What set of voters do you ask? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is you, the way, the appropriate way to do it is if he wants this authority, go to the voters of the Kansas City School District. Here's the other problem I have with it. Kansas City, the city of Kansas City, which he's taken an oath to uphold and defend those taxpayers and the people of Kansas City, uh, is broken up into 14 districts. Independence even is has a part of Kansas City there south of Woody Highway, the heart of Raytown is at. Okay, I mentioned the Turner decision, which will likely go to court involving money, who does what, tuition, all these districts. Suburban districts will have a completely contrary set of interests to the Kansas City School District. <clears throat> Mayor Sly James, now at some capacity, either by appointing somebody, is running the district. He's taken an oath to represent the people of Kansas City. In court, a Hickman Mills resident of Kansas City, Missouri, who lives in the Hickman Mills School District, and the resident of Kansas City, Missouri, who lives in the Raytown School District, will have a totally contrary set of interests, potentially, to a taxpayer who lives in Kansas City, Missouri, in the Kansas City School District. Who does the mayor represent? Which, which taxpayer of Kansas City does he represent? That's why it's an inherent conflict for him to run the schools. That's why, by the way, the people of Kansas City never conveyed that power in the charter. And the remedy, of course, is what I've told the mayor. Go to your voters and ask them. If they want you to do this, they do. Now, I will tell you, um, there is not, in my sense, a lot of support. I don't believe he's developed a consensus in Kansas City. I certainly have talked to Senator Curls and other individuals. I know there are some in support. One group that's in support is the Civic Council, the business, <coughs> part of the business community likes his plan. They're going to the, pop up the money to help Well, the problem, well, let me talk, let's talk about that. <laughs> well, On their long contemplative drives back to Johnson County, where they live, because they haven't lived downtown or sent their kids uh -huh. to the Kansas City School District uh -huh. in decades. And by the way, maybe one of the problems with the Kansas City School District is that over the years, the last three decades, they have businesses downtown that have gotten huge abatements, including the Kansas City Star, and actually hurt the Kansas City School District with revenue. Mm -hmm. So I certainly note their opinion, but I also look at the facts that they're they don't send their kids to that yeah, district. Money. My point is, in all the purpose of the law is to allow people and empower people to make decisions. That's how I view the law. Mm -hmm. Mine, absent four decades in the Kansas City School District, again, I get back to the only decision the people of the Kansas City School District have been allowed to make is who's on their school board, except once. And much to people's surprise and some people's opposition, they overwhelmingly approve that change. I want, in all of this, them to be able to make a decision. At the same time we're doing that, I want the taxpayers and voters of Raytown School District to determine their best course mm -hmm. and not have something forced down their throat. Yeah, I'm and by the way, a state kids. takeover could do that. The other thing, too, is the mayor's plan, which, again, I don't doubt Sly James. He, he's an incredibly nice man. Mm -hmm. He's 
you know, I, I, I think his concern is genuine. What, do you, what, what they leave out of it is, there's one way you hand it over to the mayor, a state takeover. The state would come in and take over that school district and hand the keys to the mayor. Really? How else does it happen? There's no voters involved. Nobody's conveyed that, that authority. Appealing? Is that what he's appealing to? Is that the, you like to have the state take over? I'm just saying can't... it's impossible not to do that. Oh. You, you, that's the mechanism of how you do that. So you, you, can't, you can't legally wipe out. Now, you'll, people mm -hmm. will find it ironic that I'm defending the Kansas City School Board, but I'm saying they were legally elected. Oh, I'm, I'm They were legally I'm elected. You're, you've got to somehow, the only way mm -hmm. the state of Missouri can do away with a school board who is legally elected by their voters and wipe them out, essentially, and hand the keys over to the mayor. You have to have the state do that. You have to have the long arm of the state of Missouri do that. Right. Yeah. Um, I have concerns about revenues. And uh, by the way, we have a school board member here, Jerome Barnes. Um, Senator, supposedly, they have a consortium of school districts, and it sounds like Senator's pulled out of that consortium surrounding school districts. And one of my concerns is maybe senators thinking they're going to be able to grab the best chunks of the tax base if they are part of it. Well, that's why I have my boundary change. That's why I have my boundary change bill. And that's why we have the contracting bill. Because you're, all your suburban school districts, including center, at our meeting, all recognize very responsibly that doing your part is not just taking the plaza. You've got to take the challenge, too. And that's why in the boundary change, before that election happens, it's determined whether it's a good idea or not. Mm -hmm. And I also want, I, and I also don't want somebody to be to use this racially. Right. I don't want them to say we're going to take just the white kids and leave the poor black kids behind. I want a front-loaded process that assures all that. Because if some idiot does that, by the way, and that could happen in current law. You're going to have the federal court back in here running that district, and that does no one any good. I, I'm just thinking that they've got they, they've got an expenditure of about seventeen thousand per student, and I'd like to see that amount go with every student, rather than you know, as you say, instead of getting the plaza, Brookside, or Parkway. Is it possible that that could be the end result that? The expense, the expense of educating those students follows the students rather than the children. Well, the problem is the current Kansas City School Board would never agree to that. They, their tuition, and I defer to a school board member, I believe, was $3,200, which is about right. one-third one one of, right. about one third of what the average student in Raytown is spent. Right. We asked 10 six. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I... I guess what I'm saying is, organically, the advantage of the boundary change is it, it, it happens and voters have that decision. It doesn't force them to make this decision. This isn't my breakup plan. It happens if people want it to happen. People, it's advantages, it's disadvantages. People don't want it to happen, it won't. But I think the contracting uh, proposal is probably necessary. The other thing is, um, I don't know that you're going to break up that entire district, but I will just tell you again from personal experience. At one time, the Kansas City School District had uh, a enrollment of seventy-five thousand stu students. It went from the Kansas border all the way to Vermont Street in Independence, Missouri. Now, we did the boundary change in Independence. A much decried superintendent named Dr. Covington came in and shut a bunch of buildings because he looked around and said. We've got a bunch of buildings based on a system, and we got 15,000 students, and we've got enough buildings for 45,000 students. And that doesn't make much sense. And we've got a lot of structures in here that are based on a district of 45,000 students. Now, he made tough decisions, and then, I believe, got word that they were going to become unaccredited and left. But uh, yeah. but that's just my opinion. But I... but. But he made those decisions. I guess what I'm getting at is that district, in my mind, geographically, is too big. It always has been. It, it, it could be far more manageable. The other thing is, as, as much as this situation creates 
and I think the suburban superintendents recognize this, you know, 15,000 students, and I'm not diminishing it, is not a huge problem if you go at it in a very controlled way involving multiple things. It breaks it down to 2,000 students, maybe. And, I mean, it's a series of seven 2,000 students. So it's not like we're dealing with a district of 50,000 students we've got to find a solution for. We're, that district is down to 14,000 students, and half of them go to charter schools. So I'm not diminishing how difficult this problem is, but it's not a huge educational problem. Do you know what the expenditure per student is at that form compared to the rest of the independent district? Because my, my thought is, if we're going to replicate the miracle of Van Horn in, say, south and east, or southeast and east, we're going to need more revenue per student than we're well, spending in Ray Town now. The boundary change bill, I'll, I'll go into some minutia of law, and you guys can take a nap while I do. <laughs> you start explaining statutes, and it's like stereo instructions. Okay, in my bill, the receiving district, in theory, let's say one of these boundary changes happens. Does not forced to, but let's say one of them happens. Somebody pursues one, and they have the receiving district, like Raytown or Independence or Hickman Mill, say, you know, this makes sense. And a petition in both gets it on the ballot. Um, when we did this in Independence, because of the funding formula for schools, funding formulas, not just in Missouri, but any state, are retrospective. What I mean is, the Raytown School District turns in last year's attendance, and we give them the money based on that. It's not prospective. If you can't calculate who's going to show up next August. So we kind of refund. It's a refund, in, in essence, sort of as a mechanism. Because of that, because of the difficulty of state funding formulas, when we did the boundary change in Independence, Independence was paid for the new kids. But guess what? Kansas City turned in those same kids because the law allowed them to do it for two years prior. So two years after those kids left Kansas City and went to Independence, Kansas City got paid for them. So here's one thing I change. You're the receiving district. You're accepting the challenge. There's more issues involved with what you're doing than the, than the sending district. Um, sending district would be the, the district that's losing, receiving. Okay, the receiving obviously is taking on the challenge. There's a double payment. As far as revenue, it's neutral because the current system double pays the, the, the old district, right? I do away with that. Say, no, the double payment goes to the receiving. Because uh, the, that little thing, by the way, that little <coughs> cost you about seven and a half million dollars. So anyway, um, I hope this clarifies. Uh, you know, I don't write bills in marble uh, anymore. And if anybody has any ideas or input, I'm happy to do it. Uh, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, I try to tell those individuals who are with the Kansas City School District that, you know, we're in a situation where really the status quo is untenable. And if they have ideas, I'm happy to listen to them of what, you know, what to do. But we can't just say that, you know, we just want the status quo because I, the other thing too is keep in mind, I talked about my ideas. There are more, there are conservatives in the legislature who believe that we should pursue vouchers and, and open enrollment and virtual schools and, you know, quite frankly, probably see a failed public education urban district as an opportunity to have a laboratory uh, of ideas. Um, so, you know, well, I always like to tell some individuals, while they may not like my bills, uh, there there is far worse out there that they should be concerned about. And I, I actually believe if you empower taxpayers, the simple point is, I believe that what independence did shows that public education can fix itself. Yes? You know, Kansas City School District problem, it is not new. You know, it has been there over decades. Right. And uh, 
we have seen that is a funding problem. We have a problem with that uh, teaching, problem with uh, school board, school board members. Right. Uh, then uh, other other things are involved too. Right now, Kansas City School District is bottom in the list. You know, it is in the nationwide possibly third worst school district. We have seen this one not this is not the first time we have been seeing this one for many years. And uh, as a senator, uh, you have lots of good input there since nineteen. Uh, I mean, two thousand and three. Uh, you try. You try to uh, help. You have experience. Uh, you have experience to annex to other school to independent uh, school district. So uh, you really can also help that what is happening right now. My question to you that uh, we know that we have an inherited problem in our school district. We know that you know funding problem is the, also one of the issues but it is there it is there don't you think we need to do some total evaluation that where is the problem relate and how to solve these things and try to do once for all because it is uh, in, in fact it is also costing our taxpayer money that's i like to hear I don't want to blame any particular sector. I want to see that solution. That's I wanted to know. In fact, just a few weeks back, I was in in White House, and I talked few of that senator, particular senator. I asked, "What is the problem in the nation?" The, he said that the main problem right now the job. The second most biggest problem is our education. That's what we need to do. We really need to do help the education system. We need to improve our country. That's what we should fight for. Right. Thank you. Um, you're right about money, but I will tell you, money has not been the cure of the problem in the Kent City School District. Uh, they spent uh, what was it? Uh, over two billion dollars in the 1990s um, on that. So, you know, it, it's not a problem that is entirely money. It's what you do with it. Um, yes. And yes. and so, uh, you know, we have a track record that it's not this poor district that, by the way, has businesses downtown that Raytown doesn't have in downtown Kansas City that pay taxes. Now, if they're dumb enough to defer those taxes and give them tax abatement like Cordish. I mean, if you bring in somebody from Baltimore and give them free land, I guess, you know, you're gonna have to pay the consequences. Uh, but um, but they have a tremendous tax base. They have the resources to run a successful district. I believe that there are issues that should be discussed about how to do it, but I don't think we get lost in that discussion to the point where we don't have time to have a total discussion of what you know, is it the school board, is it the superintendent structure, or whatever. Um, I remember during the boundary change, um, I was at a meeting and um, I went to a Kansas City School District meeting, and I think this is correct, they had 24 uh, vice superintendents of some level, I mean, just different titles. You're paying for that. Okay, you don't live in Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City School District. You're paying for it for us as a state taxpayer. That fourteen thousand dollars. Does Raytown have twenty four vice no, <laughs> vice superintendents? No. I mean, what I mean is that. And look, I there is. Let me say this: that that, that we had a very good discussion, and Sarah Pearls was there with with the suburban superintendents. Just unquestionably, in, 19, in the 1950s and 60s, the Kansas City School District was blatantly guilty of segregation. Blatantly guilty. We don't like that answer, but those lawsuits had merit. They were blatantly guilty of segregation. The world's changed, though. I mean, and what I mean is, over time, I think we've recognized that, you know, 
that situation's changed. You, you don't have an institutional system anywhere of segregation. And, and so much of the DSEG, ironically, when I did research on the boundary change and what independence did, long before all the DSEG lawsuits, the federal court went to the suburban districts and said, look, can you help? And of course, 1960s America, they go, no. So here we find ourselves, four decades later, a largely white suburban district takes on part of the Kent City School District, which happened to be an in independence in, in Sugar Creek, <clears throat> and becomes more diverse. That was one of the objectives, objectives of DSEG. I was, during that election, was on a, a program with Ar Arthur Benson. You all remember him. Um, and he used the race term. And I said, Mr. Benson, what's wrong with a largely white suburban district becoming more diverse, except a part of the Kansas City School District? Isn't that one of the objectives of DC? So, I mean, the world's changed, and I think we have to recognize that in, in, in a positive way. I mean, but, but 1960s America, 1970s America was a much different place. I may be totally wrong, but I think a lot of the Kansas City School problems start with parents. I, I think that Raytown faces similar challenges. I think Independence faces similar challenges. Uh, uh, you know, parents have changed. I, I, I am ill-equipped to discuss that because my father was born in 1908 and my mother was born in 1924, and I was raised by World War II survivors of the Depression. Uh, they had one credit card, and they kept it in the freezer. Uh, we never had Coke in the refrigerator. We occasionally had Cragmont Pop when it was on sale. And so I watch these kids now, and I'm like going, whoa, <laughs> are they getting away with murder? So I'm just saying, you're, you're right, but that whole thing is, are there unique issues to poverty, that are that's more acute right in there. Kansas City. No, that's yeah, not, that's not my, that wasn't my point. My point was there is no parental involvement with their children in their school because they feel disenfranchised because they don't have neighborhood schools. No. Because well, whatever. a neighborhood school is right. a lot to do. I right. think if they had neighborhood schools, mm -hmm. it would be a different situation. But well, what I mean is, I think for the most part, Raytown probably has a fairly good program of parent involvement in PTAs because mm -hmm. people feel part of their school district. Right. But when you do magnet schools for 10 years and you're busing a child from Independence, Missouri to go to school at 62nd and, and, and Brookside or wherever, that's not a neighborhood school. Yeah. And I think the superintendents, by the way, and I'll answer you quickly, but I think the superintendents are, are saying, look, the, if we don't do anything, you're going to have a child driving five miles to the independent school district or 15 miles to the independent school district mm -hmm. or Raytown, they're not going to feel part of the Raytown exactly. district. Why don't we contract the adjoining schools, keep them in their schools, in in, in, a, in the neighborhoods they're from? So anyway, yeah. you had a question. And you know, one of the things that you know we see here in Raytown is that you have two parents working. Right. Exactly. And they drop, exactly. drop exactly. kids off early and they don't pick them up till late. And you know, they're just like you said, just not a whole lot of involvement. We don't have a lot of that, but some of it. Uh, we've had over 150 inquirers to come to Kent, to Raytown since January 1st, and they all have been put on the waiting list. Right. But, uh, but my question was, uh, you know, the Turner case is coming up, mm -hmm. and then there's some legislation that everybody wants to pass. Right. How would that affect if the legislation passed versus the Turner case? Well, the court, um, I'm hopeful, and I don't, I certainly am not relying on this. I cannot imagine in the Turner decision the court siding with Kansas City, and you've already seen evidence of that, uh, the temporary restraining order that, right. we, that the school district sought in January. Essentially, the lawyer for the Kansas City School District uh, said, yeah. my client is blatantly not following the right. statute, We've, and the judge didn't. <laughs> And the judge didn't grant the temporary restraining order. Of course, you saw the headlines that made it sound like you guys lost. Right. Actually, the judge wasn't saying that. He was saying, yes. there's nothing to issue a temporary restraining order. These idiots aren't following the statute now. Right. right. <laughs> so we're in all that. I don't want to rely on this. I hope, regardless of what happens on boundary change and all and contracting, that we, that we do have a basic Turner fix that allows you, 
as a school district to define tuition and how all that works. There's a question behind it. Yeah. Oh, I actually, I just, just I question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to add something to, it seems like, you know, many, many years ago, Southwest was way back. I mean, this is one of the best schools in the nation. In the 1950s and 60s, it was yeah, like Rockers. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a friend whose daughter just came up here and she was just hired as a charge of the special needs kids right before the and uh, she said, so bad, that she was in charge of all the other teachers, especially ed before, and that the teachers would leave, talk out at lunch. This is, this is recently, this is just now, and, and go gamble at the casinos at lunchtime. And who knows when it come back. You know, coming back, of course, we all knew how they were throwing away money I, th I mean, it's not your, it's not the parents' fault so much. You can't always blame them. In. It's the people who have been in charge of the schools, the superintendents in the past, the teachers, everything. These people, um, you know, the teachers aren't even coming back then for the day. And they're, then when they were given the salaries for how many years of people that were living on the payroll, people were walking in and picking up paychecks. And they didn't even work anymore for years. So well, I think both you, I think both you and her are right, though. To have a, talk about defining a successful school district, you've got to have parents and teachers. The teacher can't do it alone. You've got to have, you've got to have, and the parents have to feel part of that district. And the problem with the Kansas City School District, again, is I just know from experience they they have not had people involved. I mean, right now, in the headline in the last two days, they're having trouble with people even running for kids in school. Oh, yeah, now right. they can't get them. But what Actually, I mean is, does that ever happen in right town? No. No, right. Yeah. I mean, because people want to be part of their kids' lives and their community and everything else. That's right. I, I'm just saying it's a reflection of just the total disenfranchisement of people. I mean, one PTA yeah. meeting, we had over 300 people there. Yeah. Well, they yeah. spent millions of dollars on, you know, they just need to see things like, Spending all this money on a couple schools, like the zoo school and the sport school, you know, on big pools, and you know. The and store after our boundary change is one of my favorite stories. At now, we, we walk into schools and they're all torn up. And, you know, they have, uh, and I'm not making fun of this restaurant, but they have, uh, I walk in these schools and and uh, at Now and in Van Horn and the elementary schools, and we had a tremendous community makeover. And Tom was there. And we had 2,500 people show up and take the schools overnight, and in, in one day. And I walk in there, and this is a high school, and all the walls are like painted that mental institution baby blue from the 1960s, and some awful lime green color or whatever. So what did Independence do? What are the school colors of Van Horn? Uh, white, gray, and red. Everything's white, gray, and red. <laughs> you go by Van Horn now and you see that nice red railing and people feel part of that school. And if you go by Van Horn, and, and I don't know if you remember this too, I lived in Independence all my life, and I don't know if you remember this, in the mid-90s, they had the, there was a pine tree by Van Horn, visible from Truman Road, and they cut it down, just still stuck to the stump, and it was there for three years. It, you know, it, it, it dissolved, I guess, is what happened. But I'm just saying just basic things that people think of in schools. You know, but my favorite star story uh, uh, from my paper, favorite paper was after the boundary change, they were decrying that Nallen had this menagerie. And I thought, menagerie? I've been to Nallen. And I thought, well, are there animals there? And they had a guy they were paying sixty some odd thousand dollars a year as the game warden of the menagerie at that one. And so I go with him, Dr. Henson from Independent, I go, what's this menagerie? Or whatever. And we walk in and it's a bunch of taxidermy animals. And they had a goat, a live goat in the back. And that was yeah. their menagerie. Now Henson just called up Bass Pro Shop and said, Hey, you know, you 
you know, you, you guys always like to look good, donate an aquarium. And so there's now this big, nice big aquarium of Missouri fish donated for free by that. But I'm just saying the start bit of it, oh, the menagerie's gonna, and I, what menagerie? <laughs> and, and I walk in there and it's a bunch of taxidermy animals, like, you know. And they pay somebody $50,000 watch a dead animal. I mean, so I mean, there's ample stories of, of that, but that was one of my favorites because I go, yeah, Menagerie. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you've already answered this, and if you have, I apologize. But when we talk about this fix, we talk about the rebounding and everything. Is this a permanent thing, or is it something that they're, that would they're be, looking at as a fix for a short time period? No, or no, it would be permanent. I mean, the independence thing is permanent, but what I'm saying is. It only happens if both districts say yes. I mean, that that's the protection to you. If Look, here, here's the likely circumstance. People from Kansas City are going to want to probably pursue the boundary change more than taxpayers from Grand Canyon. Right. Okay. And what I mean is you're, you, you've you got to have both. Right. In Independence, we had a petition to put it on the ballot in the Independence School District. And we had a petition to put it on the ballot in the Kansas City School District. You need both to even trigger that election. And then you got to get approved by both. So I'm, I'm just saying there's a lot of steps, and I'm not going to remove those steps because I think it, it should be hard and difficult to change boundaries, but it is permanent. Now, the contracting is kind of a hybrid where they could do it for a while, but again, I kind of see or organically that over time people might just go, well, Hickman Mills is running these schools, and five years from now they go, why don't we make it official? You know, and, and so... So then there won't be a Kansas City school district at all, ever? That's determined by that's determined by the process. I don't I don't believe that the boundary change. In no way am I suggesting that it should break up the district and abolish it, but that might happen, and maybe it makes sense to do that. I, my point is, when was the last time the people of the Kansas City School District had a referendum about any of this? And I I think it's I personally could be totally wrong, but I think if you had a basic referendum which we're not doing in law, but if you had a referendum uh, this summer, shall the Kansas City School District continue to exist, it would not surprise me if the voters in Kansas City School District said, no, let's dissolve it and start over and come up with, you know, our own things. And quite frankly, that I think that's healthy. I mean, I, I know one of the mayor's well-intentioned things was, well, we've got to have a Kansas City School District. And I said, okay, but why? Miami doesn't have a Miami school district. They have the Dade County schools. They have the, you know, you already have a city that's made up of 14 different different districts. Are people in Kansas City, Missouri, who live in the Raytown school district? Is that some form of derision that they, that they don't have Kansas City and Kansas City school district? I mean, uh, there's no, and here's my point. There's no value to that name anymore. It's probably more of a negative. So start over. Now, uh, some of my Republican colleagues, and I won't go down this road, are fond of bringing up New Orleans. But you know what happened there? The, hur the hurricane wiped out everything. And so they started the school district all over again. And actually, get there having success because they, 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 just, they could kind of start. It, you know, New Orleans was a troubled school district like Kansas City. And they just kind of started all over. What could Kansas City break up in so districts within within the Kansas City, you know. They could. Yeah. I mean, they I'm, have all kinds of options. Here, I'm not being irresponsible, but here's my point. Let people decide. I mean, my objection to the mayor's plan is no set of voters is conveying this authority. It's questionable whether it'll work. I, I, he's well-intentioned, but nobody's giving him that power. And I serve with some real morons down there. <laughs> Maybe I'm one of them. I, I don't think that we should just, you know, us philosopher kings just say, oh, the mayor will run it for a while. That sounds like a good idea. What experience does he have in running a school district? What experience does he have in picking people around a school district? You know, if Dr. Hinson lived in Kansas City or Dr. Hope lived in Kansas is it Hope still? I'm sorry. No, no Martin. Mark Martin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, Hope was there for a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they lived in Kansas City and got elected mayor of Kansas City, I might go, I might briefly go, well, he's a former school superintendent, so maybe this has some merit in the short term. But, you know, that's not the case. Yes? 
Yeah, I agree that <coughs> there's so many different options, and I agree we should be able to vote on it. Um, I just want to say, too, is that there are instances like that, if why not come? Those were the most <coughs> yeah. are, and, and they have come around so much that they won a war for being in the top right. two of the nation. Yeah. Well, I met that superintendent. And, She's very. Yeah, uh, and what I never understand, why don't they just, it seems like, you know, this could have been done years ago. When you see, and the other one who's done this as a mayor is New York City. I heard the State of the Union uh, two years ago, and his whole State of the Union <coughs> happened on to it, and it was fabulous. His whole focus was the schools. Right. He didn't talk about anything else about that city. And they have increased that school so well, improved it, that almost all the kids are going to college, the percentage is up above 80%, graduating. And you know, it just seems like it shouldn't have been this hard for those over 30 something years. And some people with some brains to just say, well, why can't we just copy the good schools? Well, and here's my point about New York, though, keep in mind on the mayor. Some cities, uh, uh, I mean, there's no magic any of this. Some cities have had a disaster with the mayor. Milwaukee, sure. Chicago has had a mixed say, result, even mayor, though even though Bernie mayor. Duncan, I mean, the Chicago thing is sort of a mixed result, too. But my point is, in all of those cases, they were stronger forms of government, and some set of voters made a decision right. to convey that authority on the mayor. Well, I have one other question on voting. Now, that would be our vote would be our vote, right, and the state Congress cannot interfere. It's like when we go to first different laws on, on the, uh, it's the uh, minimum wage, and then they coop it. You know, you have 80% votes for the voters, and they say, oh, too bad. You know, they well, you still have the minimum wage. But. Right. Well, but they change the parts of the vote and the puppy. The puppy they did. Yeah, the puppy. Well, so they don't come in and say, they don't we don't have no puppy. No, the puppy. There's just no just, just the, let me change defend change. the puppy thing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll just tell you. I mean, the start of all this that they're changing the world. Look, the voters said, we want bad puppy mills shot, right? That's what that Prop B said to me, right? And I voted for it. And, you know, okay. That's what they said to me. Now, there are people, and I don't really know, but I tour both. There are people who are in the dog business because they love dogs and they have a kennel. And they're not in it to game the system and make a bunch of money. They're in it because they love dogs and they have a kennel. And to make it a felony that you don't refresh the water every four hours probably shouldn't be in law. And probably, you know, I, I know the U.S. Humane Society who right now in California has a, every chicken has to be free range. And, I, and I'm sorry if I'm offending some of sensibilities, but you know, I'm not a farmer, but animals are animals, okay? <laughs> they don't have rights. They have our requirement to give them humane treatment and decent treatment, but rights is a human thing, you know? So anyway. Rick, I got one, one more for you. Um but all, all that happened in the puppy mill thing is the Department of Ag was given the authority to regulate, license all of them. By the way, in the last summer since we passed this, Chris Coster has shut down four puppy mills. So everybody who says Prop B was changed, or, okay, uh, I take exception because we, we, we actually approved the enforcement part and the will of the voters well, how long saying, was we want the bad guys regulated. I'm just saying the fact that they come in and change the thing I was going to ask you was uh, the fact that most of the time we're dealing with uh, poverty mm -hmm. in the Kansas City School District sure. is the biggest issue for me. It's about the kids, you know. And um, I, I went to a workshop one time uh, that was given about your brain on poverty. And they've actually scientifically, you know, sure. developed to say, you know, that if you, are, you don't have enough to eat, Nutrition too, right? You cannot, you cannot. Uh, and there's data, the there's data that that uh, right. poverty also has you select bad foods, like exactly, yeah. exactly. And so the reason I'm bringing that up is because until we address that, I don't think moving the kids around in different directions is going to make much difference. 
And so I'm just bringing that up for people I'd right. like to start thinking about because I don't think that suburban city or uh, the suburban districts are thinking enough about that. It's easy to blame everything. Well, for Kansas city. I would take exception to that. I think the Raytown School District has probably a lot of background in uh, educating kids who are impoverished. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I am. There are people in Independence who, you know, right. the Independence. But I don't think they I have mean, the poverty knows no boundaries. You're right. Yeah, boundary. yeah, we, right. Have, right. we have breakfast. You know, we feed we feed kids breakfast. We got you know low cost. Right. You know, so we feed them in the morning time. Give them right. lunch. Right. Like snack. Yeah, that snack. They yeah. just send home for a weekend. Yeah, right. 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 Absolutely. The Kansas City District is now accredited by the State of Education. Right. Does the board come in and actually take over districts? And if they do, what's their history? Like, how they do it and what their outcome is? Well, it's mixed, uh, and we're very concerned. Right now, in state law, it would require the, this, the, and the department of it, which we call DESE, you know, the government would have to come up with some clever <laughs> title of acronym of the letter, but DESE essentially would now, under current law, have to wait two years to come in. They want to change that because they want the option of coming in. So quite frankly, maybe they will have to. Now, I'm not wild about a state takeover. The state in 2005 took over the St. Louis School District, who had been mm -hmm. unaccredited for two years prior to that, um, and or a year prior to that. Uh, the reality with the St. Louis and Kansas City School District, while they officially became unaccredited, I think one could credibly argue they've been actually unaccredited for a couple of decades, probably. Right. Um, and so, yeah, the state, Judy, it's been a mix. You know, St. Louis is kind of coming back. We're into year six or year five, I think, where there's some signs of improvement. The other thing that your question raises that I think everybody has to keep in mind is accreditation, don't, this isn't a movie, and they're not going to take a test in the Kansas City School District in May and pass it and get back to provisional. It's a long process. It, 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 we're looking at five to seven years, five to seven years of trying to get out of unaccredited status. And people don't understand that, that they think that, you know, um, what was the movie with the, uh, you know, you've seen movies like this, like Michelle Pfeiffer and Somebody asked today, and the, I met with the caucus in the house, and somebody said, Michelle Pfeiffer and Morgan Freeman are going to come in and have everybody, you know, take tests, and they're going to pass them, and they'll be, oh, we're provisionally. No, if you talk to Christo Castro, like I have, who's the commissioner of education, uh, you know, it's a five to seven year process, maybe ten. They have to show years, several years of consistent improvement. But how does the state physically come in and take over? Do they put their people in administration? There's a hybrid in St. Louis that they would probably emulate, which is that they have some elements of locally appointed people, and but it's ultimately run by DESE, and the way the state does it is they come in and grab the money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, they keep it there, but I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, but their control is they grab the purse strings. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Good job. Good job. Thank you very much.